Below the black stripe running across these eroding hills in Montana lie dinosaurs. Last summer, a full skeleton was uncovered of the most famous of them all. Tyrannosaurus rex, carnivorous tyrant lizard king. Favorite of special effects departments since films began. The discovery in Montana is now revealing the real Tyrannosaurus. The badlands of the American West have been rich dinosaur country for over a century. Thousands of bones were found, but only seven incomplete skeletons of T-Rex. As with today's predators, carnivores numbers were few, so fossils are rare. Everything we know about this creature has been based on just a few specimens. Then in night... You better come down to the lab with us. So we went way downstairs through locked doors and everything, which was exciting for us in itself. Before they can start more delicate work, the crew must shift 100 tons of rock by hand. A bulldozer could do the job in a few hours. over 100 degrees. But this exhausting work already looks promising. I'm interested in knowing the kinds of animals that lived at about the same time as this Tyrannosaurus rex. And that includes the fish and the turtles and the crocodiles. I mean, I, I want to be able to find examples of of everything that was out here. Dinosaurs lived successfully on Earth for 140 million years. Tyrannosaurus appeared towards the end, flourishing in the late Cretaceous period around 65 million years ago. Out here, the right age sediment is exposed at the surface. So we can walk around out here and be literally walking on on the sediments that the dinosaurs lived in. In other words, the right age is exposed here. There just enough has eroded off the top and it hasn't eroded too deep so that, that we can find them here. These hills are part of a large sandstone formation known as Hell Creek. It stretches north from Montana into Canada and south into Wyoming and South Dakota. Before the North American continent took on a recognized form, the interior was covered by an inland sea, now called the Cretaceous Seaway. Dinosaurs lived along its coastal floodplains. When they died, streams and rivers sometimes deposited sand and silt over their bodies, burying and preserving them as fossils. Erosion has sculpted the floodplain into these barren badlands and once again exposed the end of the age of dinosaurs. Early June, the Montana T-Rex's protective plaster jacket is carefully removed. Soon they'll know how well preserved and how complete it is, and how much it can tell them about its life. But while T-Rex's head is fearsome, the arms seem absurdly small for such a hunter. If you use your imagination and, and just try to conjure up what it would look like if a Triceratops is running down the street and a Tyrannosaurus Rex is running down the street and the Tyrannosaurus Rex wants to catch that Triceratops, but the Triceratops doesn't want to get caught. Now, but it's an ecological rule. If you're a big land animal, you can't be a pure scavenger. Hyenas today scavenge, but they make kills too. 
Lions scavenge, but they make kills too. Wolves will eat dead buffalo they find, but they will also kill bison. That's a rule that's never broken. So this great, powerful skull was used in killing live active prey and also dismembering festering fly maggot-ridden carcasses, both. And maybe hid in, the, hid in the bushes and kicked a triceratops over as they walked by. I mean, <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't... Imagination. The static upright image stuck too, but it probably wasn't what Osborne had quite intended. Osborne was director of the American Museum of Natural History. He was a showman who liked spectacular dinosaur displays. He made scale models of T-Rex in dynamic fight scenes. But the actual fossil bones were far too heavy to mount in these off-balance postures. Osborne was obliged to settle for the static, upright, perhaps unnatural pose. Professor Osborne found the first skeleton, and he wanted to mount it like this, up and active. But the engineers couldn't produce the ironwork. We worked with hollow fiberglass casts and could bring Osborne's dream to life. Why did Osborne believe this great animal was so active? For a couple of good reasons. The knee has this great surface of bone here, the attachment point for the calf muscle, one of the major running muscles a giant Tyrannosaurus drumstick right here. And attached to that calf muscle was the Achilles tendon, wrapping around here and going to the toes. A tendon so large, it was bigger and stronger than all the tendons and all four feet of a galloping white rhinoceros. This great beast was not designed as a plotter. This great beast was designed as a runner. It may well have been a fairly good runner. Uh, at least in comparison with other large animals. Uh, but I don't think that these simple gestalt arguments, these just sort of looking at it and saying, oh gosh, look at that, it looks like it was a runner, therefore it was a runner, uh, that doesn't strike me as an adequate way, adequate way of going about this. Uh, you have to bring as many different lines of evidence to bear as you can. The only real evidence of dinosaur movement is their footprints, trackways left in mud which became rock. No They're striders, uh, they have a three-toed dinosaur-like foot, and birds along with crocodiles are the closest living relatives of dinosaurs. It's the closest thing to a bipedal dinosaur we're gonna get in today's world. That's the way. <laughs> this logical re- <laughs> Into the dirt. <coughs> oh boy. it's not going to work. But eventually it's pointed in the right direction. Okay. Left, right, and another left. So we got a, a nice sequence. Take stride is two, one, five, seven, y to the x. So previous data using the formula are reliable. Small dinosaurs could probably do up to 25 miles per hour. But what about the enormous Tyrannosaurus, which left no tracks to measure? The fast-running dinosaurs for which we have found trackways were of animals that were probably fairly closely related to Tyrannosaurus. And so the fact that these relatives of Tyrannosaurus were able to run suggests that it's not out of the question to expect that an animal like Tyrannosaurus itself could have run. A characteristically unorthodox approach to the problem is taken by Robert Bakker. The only way to look at T-Rex's speed is to look at it as a machine. You get a tape measure. You wrap the tape measure around the thigh bone of T-Rex. You look at your tape measure, it says 422 millimeters, it says 17 inches. You make a model of the T-Rex, you can calculate its weight, coming around four tons. A thigh bone 17 inches around for a four-ton animal gives you more strength per pound than a white rhino. And that's a fact. That's not speculation. That's not theory. Those are just numbers. Now, I've been chased by white rhinos. They'll do 28 miles an hour in a full gallop, right? They can catch you in a Jeep. So a four-ton T-Rex, 30 or 40 percent stronger, is pushing 40, 42 miles an hour in a straight run. 
Are scientists sure T. rex weighed four tons? Jim Farlow uses McNeil Alexander's method and Archimedes principle to find out. The volume of water displaced by the toy T. rex determines its own volume. Scale that up, length times height times width, multiply that by 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter and you have the likely body mass. With this plastic model, Farlow gets an estimated seven tons. Some give as little as four tons and others as much as eight. On a scale of relative athletic ability based on strength per pound, a plodding elephant scores low and a running ostrich high. A seven-ton Tyrannosaurus is not much better than the elephant, but at four tons, it's up among the faster runners. What does that prove? It's really hard to say for sure. Um, there are just so many sources of uncertainty here, particularly in the mass estimate of the dinosaur, that I would not want to have to commit myself to saying that Tyrannosaurus was, was definitely capable of running at any given speed. If Tyrannosaurus rex was just fumbling around, you know, like a bipedal elephant, it would have a thigh only half as thick as it's got. So if you find a machine, a fossil machine, that's very strong, or full of air chambers, or has a sophisticated set of uh, blood vessels, demands that you pay attention to those adaptations, not explain them away. It's a lot of explaining away going on with dinosaurs. Some people take a hypothesis if it sounds plausible, if it sounds reasonable, they assume it has to be true. But in the history of science, there have been many plausible, many reasonable ideas that have turned out not to be true. And so if you're going to call your procedure scientific, if you're going to play by the rules of science, uh, you have to look for ways of testing this hypothesis, of potentially proving that it's wrong. Uh, otherwise, you're not much different from a medieval philosopher. Sometimes the, in order to get closer to the truth, you have to speculate a little further than your evidence takes you. And, I don't know, sometimes that might make someone else mad. <laughs> so they will go out and look into it and maybe get a little more information. Um, I, speculation is healthy. It's very healthy. I think what is important is that the general public understand that that just because one scientist says this is what happened, that doesn't mean that's what happened. That's what they think happened. I mean, that's their speculation. Mid-June in Montana, the hill has been reduced. Pat Legey, dig foreman. This is where the, the wall came up to previously, last year. Possibly coming around so it'd be upside down. <laughs> Orientated block <laughs> sticking up. First we thought it might be pterygoid that we were talking about. Studying the bones in place is the biggest difference between dinosaur digging today and the way it was done at the birth of dinosaur science. Then the object was to get the bones out of the ground as fast as possible. Dinosaur digging was a competitive business. America's East Coast Natural History Museum sponsored expeditions. They all wanted the biggest and best. Nowadays we're trying to learn about these animals, trying to find out what they were like as living creatures. And we do take things like the Tyrannosaurus rex back to the museum, and it will be a showpiece. But we're also trying to learn something about that animal, so we're digging it up slower. We're not blowing it out of the ground with dynamite. We're taking notes on the kind of sediment that it's in. We're mapping it, see how it lies there. We're doing the science. Well, now that we've been at this a few days, uh, we're finding out that this is probably the most complete Tyrannosaurus rex ever found. And we're lacking things like uh, the end of a tail and some feet, but generally everything is here. And just taking the skull as an example here, just to orient ourselves, this is the back of the skull again. And down this way, it's the tip of the snout. It's very wide at the back and very narrow at the front. And even just working around here today, we found that the skull is more complete than we previously thought. And we've also been doing so it may represent an entirely new type of dwarf tyrannosaur that deserves its own classification. Robert Bakker suggested its name, Nanotyrannus, 
pygmy tyrant. But Nano Tyrannus might be a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. One way to find out would be to break open the skull to see if the bones are fused, as in adults, or loosely knit, as in an animal whose skull is still growing. Andrew Leach, a British paleontologist, helps Nano Tyrannus receive a CT, or CAT scan. Andrew Leach and Robert Bakker can now see its interior architecture. Not high enough or too high? A little tiny, there's obviously little mm -hmm. thin plates in there. That doesn't allow for bifurcation, that allows for, you know, three different lobes there. Is that what's happening at the end of the, the olfactory stalk? Is it really branching into that many stems? Mm, I've never seen that before. Partition grows as each yeah, of them yeah, grow from yeah. each side of the, the brain case. That's an adult character. That's uh, okay. when we're very solid in the brain case. The other interesting thing is there's a shelf off the maxilla that come out, comes right in. Yeah. And it's, it's bigger than the one you see in an Albertosaurus. The walls are coming down now. Is that held in place by a cartilage or is it just sort of a bridge? So Nano Tyrannus is not a juvenile T. rex, but a species in its own right. The computer can assemble a three-dimensional image from the scanned sections. With no need to touch the fragile skull itself, the image can be rotated. And the rocky matrix surrounding the bone mixed out to show the skull's light, almost bird-like architecture. The success of this experiment will be important for the study of Montana's T-Rex. Erosion in the Badlands is sometimes a violent process. The now vulnerable Tyrannosaurus must be protected. The danger has passed. Though there are smaller hazards out here. But dinosaur specialists must tolerate another delaying distraction. We can't say for sure this is what they did, because we can't see it. And the skeletons Paleontologists the must face the cameras and feed the insatiable public appetite for information about dinosaurs. And I think that's because it's, you know, it was the largest meat-eating animal that ever walked on this earth. T-Rex has always attracted publicity. We're still fighting Hollywood cavemen in the late 1960s. Don Glute studies the popular culture of dinosaurs. He thinks their fascination stems from the nature of the science. Paleontology is really, a, I think, a combination of two things. It's a combination of science, uh, where we have bones that tell us a great deal. But then a lot, of, a lot of what we know about the animals stems from our own imagination. That's one of the beauties of paleontology. It's not just hardcore science. It's not just something we can measure and look at it under a microscope. We have to 
try to imagine what these animals were like when they were alive. Our enjoyment of these safely extinct monsters has created a huge industry of toys and entertainment. The best combine fun and good information. A did dinosaur these. Some dinosaurs were herbivores. Now that means that they ate only plants. They were harmless creatures with teeth suitable only for chewing soft plant food. Russell's But some dinosaurs had rows and rows of huge teeth. They were the carnivores. Yeah. That means they ate only meat. Sometimes they ate other dinosaurs. I think I'm gonna be sick. Too much popularity can endanger serious science. Because of the nature of the dinosaurs, these big spectacular animals, many of them, uh, you tend to attract the public. And when you attract the public, paleontologists may get um, um, trapped into a popular approach themselves. Maybe they don't want to talk about development of muscles when the newspaper comes to them, because the, the newspaper isn't interested in the development of muscles. They want to know something about, was this animal grabbing its prey and tearing it apart, you know? Dinosaur science does have a bit of an image problem. Uh, I have run into this several times where the impression is that we're all a bunch of flakes who work on dinosaurs, that we are not rigorous in our approach, and that we're a bunch of media hounds or something like that. What an incredibly stupid, topsy-turvy world it is when scientists say, if you're entertaining, it's not real science. I mean, pure science is fun for the mind. The reason we study dinosaurs is not to find oil or cure diseases. You can't do that. The reason we, we study dinosaurs is because people are interested. The human species is a curious species. People want to know. The dilemma may explain why, unlike in Britain, no large research museum in America has a dinosaur specialist on its staff. It's also true that less spectacular extinct creatures contribute more to the study of paleontology. You have to face the fact that the dinosaur record is not rich. If you're studying uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, you've only got five or six specimens to study. If I'm studying a fossil uh, rodent from 50 million years ago, I have hundreds of specimens. So from that, you can, you can even, if, even if the specimens are incomplete or broken or something, you can get an idea of what the animal was like and what the variation, individual variation was. We don't know what individual variation was in, in dinosaurs. When you've got just a, a few specimens, you really don't know. We don't know growth stages for most dinosaurs. We just don't have enough specimens. So part of the problem is that it's a, uh, um, a, a shortage of animals. They're big. They certainly are big. But they're not numerous. Dinosaurs may not be the ideal kinds of fossils to study if you're going to ask questions about the pattern and rate of evolution, but they can provide evidence that bear on other interesting kinds of questions. The dinosaurs are wonderfully uh, heuristic. They lead you to think about major questions of, of evolution. Top predators, interaction of predators with prey, uh, big herbivores with plants, changes of the environment, mass extinctions, disease. Nearly every major question that you could ask about land vertebrate evolution has been asked about dinosaurs. And since the fossils are so precise in their anatomical detail, you can get at these questions. You know, we see hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on, on finding what the inside of an atom looks like or, or trying to see the edge of the universe. And, and here, I mean, we're out here trying to reconstruct the, the evolutionary biology of the past. I mean, what, what things were really like on this earth. And we have a difficult time getting funding for it. And I'm not saying it's unfair. I, it's not exactly, I, I, quite, I just haven't quite figured out how we go out and, and convince people that what we're doing is just as important as seeing the edge of the universe. This matrix back in the museum laboratory.
A very old archaeological technique is used to reinforce the blocks and protect them. The last stage is to undercut the blocks and load them. The US Army Corps of Engineers has donated its vehicles and expertise for this job. The final load almost becomes T-Rex's last stand. Three and a half tons of its massive fossilized pelvis nearly defeats the US Army. Late in the day, Tyrannosaurus rex is safely on the move for the first time since the species vanished from the Earth. Paleontologists argue endlessly about dinosaur extinction. A favorite hypothesis is the catastrophe from outer space. An asteroid or meteor crashes to Earth, dust thrown into the atmosphere shrouds the world. The asteroid would have left a crater 100 times bigger than the mile-wide meteor crater in Arizona. Possible traces of such an impact have now been identified in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And there is some evidence closer to the T-Rex site. The black layer in this Montana hillside is a marker in geological time called the Z-Coal. It records the boundary between the age of dinosaurs and the age of mammals. Just below the Z-Coal is a thinner layer containing the element iridium in quantities usually found in extraterrestrial bodies and in this boundary layer worldwide. One geologist is not quite convinced of its significance for dinosaurs. By the time the asteroid actually hits, Dinosaur populations are well into decline, and there are only a few kinds of dinosaurs left in North America. They are not dying of fright waiting for the asteroid to hit. Something else has to be taking them out. Rigby is more interested in the evidence that dinosaurs survived. These are fragments of turtle, fish, a tiny mammal jaw. And with them were dinosaur teeth. You go from 13 kinds right before the boundary, and right after the boundary, there are still 13 kinds. We cannot attribute the extinction of a single dinosaur species to the asteroid event. And even this much farther up the hill now, there are still five kinds still present. And this represents probably something some several tens to perhaps a few hundred thousand years beyond the asteroid impact layer. Jack Horner needs proof on a larger scale that dinosaurs survived into the age of mammals. There's no way to say for sure about anything, but 
the only way you can demonstrate that that you did have a dinosaur for sure is if you find a skeleton. And it doesn't have to be all the parts. It has to be enough parts so that you know that that it wasn't picked up from other sediments and dumped. In other words, redeposited. Yes. I'd like to find a dinosaur in a half shell, if you would, please. I, all connected. I mean, all the bones there smiling at you with a sign that says, I beat the asteroid and lived. But you don't find whole dinosaurs up here? No, you don't find whole dinosaurs up here. Any fossil that makes it into the rock record here is a winner. Uh, the probability of dinosaurs surviving complete and intact anywhere as articulated specimens is a very rare occurrence. But when you get rare and more rare dinosaurs as herd size and kinds of dinosaurs decrease, to get any kind of articulated remains becomes increasingly rare. So I don't look at us ever having that possibility here. The arguments about dinosaur ex Tyrannosaurus rex now almost fills their laboratory at the Museum of the Rockies. They now know it's complete except for three or four feet of the tail and a couple of ribs. The animal weighed about four tons and was 40 feet long. Its usual stance was horizontal, 12 feet high. Analyzing the internal bone structure should confirm the possibility that this was a vigorous and warm-blooded animal. The arm which Kathy Wankel first found has astonished them. It's the same length as a human arm, but incredibly strong. They now know a Tyrannosaurus could lift over 400 pounds in weight. Whether it was a hunter or a scavenger is now even more of a puzzle. In August, the lab team got news no one could have dreamed possible. Eroding bones had been found by Sue Hendrickson while surveying in the Hell Creek sandstone, this time down in South Dakota. She noticed its femur, two articulated vertebrae and ribs in a rocky outcrop. The huge skull was found a week later its seven-inch serrated teeth still in place. Then the pelvis, bigger than the man digging it out. The great curving tail. And one four-and-a-half-foot-long femur. The Montana team were delighted. The new Tyrannosaurus rex is as complete as theirs, but larger, more robust. Male and female? Jack Horner now thinks he has Tyrannosaurus regina. The new skull has an eye horn, which may be a male characteristic. Cat scanning both skulls should answer these questions. But for something this size, a military scanner used for examining Minuteman missile engines will be needed. The barren Hell Creek formation is now recognized as a vast cemetery of dinosaurs. How many more of the most successful creatures to live on the earth lie here awaiting discovery? Thank you.